Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you're uh, all continuing to find ways to cope with the current uh, situation. Um, let's uh, carry on directly with lecture. I don't think I have any housekeeping notes. Um, if anybody has any questions about PyroSim, uh, ideas for their uh, final project, or aspects of PyroSim that would be helpful for their final project, uh, feel free to type them into chat. Uh, just as a reminder, I have office hours immediately following today's lecture, which will finish today at 9.45 uh, a.m. Eastern Time. Okay, so uh, we're working our way through a three-part lecture on uh, collective robotics and looking at tasks where it may be difficult or impossible for any one robot to perform the task. So instead, we'd like to field or ev first evolve and then field a collection of relatively uh, simple uh, agents or robots that can coordinate their actions. But as we saw last time, in order to uh, organize their actions uh, at a certain level of sophistication, they're going to need to have some ability to communicate, which raises the question, if we're evolving our robots, how do they go about evolving the ability to communicate from populations of non-communicating agents? So we were partway through uh, lecture 20, uh, 24 last time, the evolution of communication, and we were looking at uh, a relatively simple uh, simulated world, which was a grid world made up of 40,000 uh, cells. Uh, the cells are connected in a toroidal pattern like we saw last time. So a male agent moving in a particular direction, if it continues moving in that direction uh, and does not encounter any other females or any other agents, will continue moving uh, forever. Uh, in this experiment, we saw that we have uh, agents that have uh, sexes. We have 800 male and 800 female uh, agents. The females are controlled by a neural network, which takes as input the direction and heading of the closest male in her territory, and the output layer is the song that she emits in response to that detected male. That binary string at the output layer of uh, the female network is fed into the input layer of any males that happen to be in her territory. That uh, those input values in the male neural network flow through the hidden layer to the output layer. The output layer contains four output neurons. We look at every time step for every given male. What is the maximum value of these four output neurons? And if the third output neuron has the highest value, the male will turn left at that time step. We looked at reproduction in this case. If a male, if a male moves into the same cell as a female, uh, the male produces a randomly modified copy of itself, M prime, and the female produces a randomly modified copy of herself, F prime, producing the son uh, and the daughter. The son and the daughter overwrite or delete some other male and female elsewhere on the toroidal uh, grid, and the male and female parents are moved to randomly chosen uh, empty cells elsewhere on the toroid. Uh, we start. We ended last time by looking at uh, an evolutionary run. In this case, remember there are no generations because males move, and if they find a female, they reproduce, uh, and this happens asynchronously from one time step. Uh, to the next. So uh, at the first, uh, at the hundredth time step in the simulation, we can see that 25% uh, of the time uh, our males are moving randomly. So for each of the eight possible signals that they might hear when they move into uh, the territory of a female, about 50% of the time on average, they will perform one of the four actions. Not surprising, assuming, not, not surprising given at this early time in the evolutionary history of this simulation. The females are controlled by random uh, neural networks with randomly set synaptic weights, and the males are controlled by networks with randomly set synaptic weights as well. But after not too long a period of time, after about 5,000 time steps uh, in this simulation, we see that most of the males have evolved the strategy uh, to move uh, forward. Uh, most to move forward, but then eventually communication starts to evolve in the simulation. There are a growing number of males that will turn right when they enter a female's ter territory and she sings the song 101, and a large number of males that will turn left when they enter a female's territory and she sings the song 110. 
We ended last time by seeing how this might work. Imagine we have a male down here in the south, south southwest of the female. Females in the center here. Assume that this uh, southwest male is heading east. And when the male is directly south of the female, the, imagine that the female is able to sense that, or she is able to sense that, and imagine that she changes her song, and that song causes a male to turn left. So the male is now south of the female facing north. The female now may stop her song and switch back to the original song that caused the male to move forward, in which case in two time steps later, the male will enter the same cell as the female and they will mate. Okay, so that's the basic idea. That's as far as we got last time. Um, before we go further into the experiment, we're going to look at a control experiment here, and I apologize for the quality of this figure. Um, the control curve is shown here, uh, and it's got these small circles here, and the test case is shown here. We have evolutionary time in the simulation measured in just the number of time steps. So at every time step, each female is allowed to emit her song. And at each time step, each male is allowed to perform one of those four male actions. You'll see that in the control case, the males were deafened, so they were not able to hear a female song. But again, their neural networks uh, were evolving as were the female uh, networks. And you'll notice that uh, after some evolutionary time, males uh, on average take less moves. They take on average less than 50 moves to find a female. So they're evolving to become better and better at locating and mating with the females compared to the deaf males, which is not surprising. However, what might be surprising at the beginning is um, for the first uh, what is that? For the first 5,000 time steps or so, the deafened males evolve to do better than the males that can hear. Why might that be the case? Why in the control case with deafened males are they able to evolve faster than the males that are able to hear? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. This is a good way to test your intuition about this experiment before we continue on with some more results. What is happening during this evolutionary period that is causing the males who are able to hear to take longer to find females? Uh, one idea is not hearing a song means they don't guess incorrectly about its meaning. Uh, that is exactly correct. Uh, these males that are deafened, as we saw before, are evolving the ability to just go straight. If you cannot hear or see a female, your best bet is to just keep moving straight and not waste any of your time steps turning right, turning left, or standing still, because in these three cases, the male continues to occupy the same cell and is therefore guaranteed not to find uh, a female. So this uh, illustrates one of the hidden costs of communication is that it takes time to evolve. We need to evolve, the females need to evolve so, such that they emit the correct song. So for example, the female here may emit song one, uh, which means, at least according to the female, that the male should continue moving forward. So she emits song one when the male is either in this cell, this cell, or is in this cell and this cell facing north. But she emits a second song, which to her means turn left. So a male moving this way, moving east, should turn left and face north. So we need her to evolve uh, to emit song one when the male is here, here, or here and here facing north. And we need the male to move straight to continue moving forward when that male hears song one and to turn left when the male hears song two. So we need, uh, we need, the, uh, we need the signaler and the signaling to both uh, evolve a certain capability. This is a particular challenge in the evolution of language. Um, there are very few species on this planet that are capable of language and that might be the explanation or at least part of the explanation for why that's the case.
Okay, here's another sort of cartoon about how this actually works and why this is so difficult. Uh, we have the female here in the center, and hopefully you can see in the stream here, she is currently emitting the song 000. A male in panel B here enters her territory to the southwest. She detects that the male is southwest of her and facing north, and she changes her song to 101, causing the male to move north, when the male is on the same line as her, directly west, she switches her song to 011, causing the male to turn right, at which point she changes her song to 101. So this female will emit the song 101, meaning go forward, and 011, meaning turn right, uh, and then switch back to go forward. So which males is this female able to attract? Assuming that males uh, do go forward when they hear 101, and the male will turn right when the male hears 011, what collection of males is she able to capture? So what I mean by that is from what direction relative to the female do the males enter the territory and which heading do they have to have for the female to be able to capture uh, these males? If you have an idea, go ahead and t type it into chat. So my apologies, I may not have uh, given you all the data you needed to answer this question. Uh, we, we don't know under what conditions the female will emit 101 and 011. Uh, coming from the south and facing forward, uh, so facing forward, I think you mean facing north here. Uh, that's correct. What happens if we have a male uh, that is that enters from the southeast and continues to move north? Well, as long as the female also emits the song 101, even when she detects a male to the north, uh, to the southeast of her and facing north, then it will work. So let's look at exactly the same uh, female here. Let's see, make sure this is the same female. Uh, sorry, this is a different, a different female here. So in this case, the female emits song 011 when, an, when a male enters her territory, and 011 means go forward, and this male responds correctly, continues moving forward. When the male is directly north of her, this, uh, imagine that this female is only able to uh, emit the song 101, meaning turn left, so she's only able to tell the male to turn left, not turn right. As long as she keeps emitting that song as the male is turning left, so on panel D uh, to panel E, the male turns left. From panel E to panel F, the male turns left again. She continues emitting song 101 until the male has turned left and is now facing her, and the, male, and the female switches back to the song 011, which means uh, go forward. So I think you get the idea here is that the female needs to be able to emit different songs to capture a larger and larger uh, number of males entering her territory from different directions and heading in different uh, directions. Okay. Okay, let's have a look now at a second experiment. This is exactly the same as the previous experiment, but in this case, the investigators made one change, which is they reduced the output layer of the female controller to just two output neurons. I'll back up to the female controller for a moment. Uh, the output, the female network is gonna contain only two output neurons, and the male input layer is only gonna contain two neurons. Because those neurons are binary, that means that females can emit only one of four possible songs. And like before, males are gonna be able to perform any one of uh, four possible actions. By reducing that, they can actually produce in this table here a representation of every single one of the 800 males. Each 
each one of the 800 males and exactly what each of those males do when they hear any one of these four songs. So let me walk you through this table so you can see how this works. Uh, let's go to the top left here. Um, the number to the left of the colon represents the number of males that respond in a particular way. So we have four males um, and this should actually this should actually have four zeros here. Each column here or each digit corresponds to one of the four songs and the integer at that digit 0, 1, 2, or 3 indicates which of the four actions that male performs. So these four males will stay still in all four conditions for the four songs. Uh, the next uh, entry over here, there are six males that will stay still when they hear 0, 0. They will stay still when they hear 0, 1. They will stay still when they hear 1, 0. And they will go forward when they hear 1, 1. Okay. Um, just to test your intuition, let's go to the very, uh, let's go to the top right over here. There are four males. How do those four, four males respond to the four female songs? If you have an idea, you can just type it directly into chat. See if you can test your intuition uh, to see that you can read this, this table correctly. Okay, go forward, uh, go forward for song one zero. That's right. So one zero is the third song, uh, and uh, this male will go forward when they hear song one zero, and they will turn right when they hear the fourth song, which is one one exactly. Uh, yeah, that's right. So you got the idea. You'll notice at the very first time step in this simulation. Again, we have 800 random females and 800 random males. So, not surprisingly, we get a uniform distribution of all sorts of different groups of males that do all kinds of different things uh, for different songs. We're now going to step forward through this table in time to time step 8,000. And you'll notice that at time step 8,000, a large number of these groups of males have gone extinct. And there are very much larger groups of males that respond in particular ways. If you scan all of the numbers to the left of the colons, uh, in this figure, you'll notice that the largest species at the moment is this one. There are 547 males that respond 1311. So one corresponds to go forward in response to the first song and turn left when they hear the second song. And if you remember the cartoons that we just looked at a few slides back, assuming that the female uh, emits the right, the, the correct one of these two songs under the right conditions, she can actually guide the male uh, into her cell. It turns out uh, in this figure, we're only looking at the males. It doesn't show us what the females are doing, but it turns out that uh, these males respond to a particular species of females that only ever emit uh, signals or songs, uh, one of the first two songs, zero, zero, and zero, one. So these males, when they enter these females' territories, these females only ever emit one of the two songs. They don't use song three or four. If we continue moving forward uh, to time step 10,000, we'll notice the emergence of a second species of males up here, and there are 127 of them. These 127 uh, males uh, move, turn, uh, go forward when they hear the third song, and they turn right when they hear the fourth song. And these males are able to successfully mate when they enter the territory of a certain group of females that existed at this point in time. And those females only ever emit songs three, 
and 4. So we have two species made up of a group of males and females. The females of the species 1 emit the first two songs and the males respond appropriately. In the second species, we also have males and females, though the females in species 2 only emit the third and fourth songs, and the males of that species respond appropriately. If one of these males enters, uh, if a male from species 1 enters the territory of a female of species 2, those two cannot mate because remember that females from species 2 only emit songs 3 and 4 but this male from species one will go forward in both of those cases. So unless that male enters the territory along the cardinal direction of the female or the cross coming out of the female, uh, the male will not find the female and there is little to no interbreeding between these two species. I'm going to advance to the next slide in a moment, but before I do, uh, and, and that's going to be another one of these tables shown at uh, further forward in time in this particular simulation, what do you expect we will see in this next figure of these two species? What evolutionary event do you think will occur as we run the tape forward of this particular evolutionary process? Remember that the males and females that are finding one another produce randomly modified copies of each other, which slightly alters the male's movement behavior in response to songs, and uh, mutated females change which songs they emit under which conditions. What is likely to occur? We have two species, two distinct species at this point uh, in time, and each species speaks a distinct language. Uh, either one of the two species will start to dominate or both species will start to coexist, possibly. Uh, at the moment, in, at this moment in time, both species are coexisting. Clearly there are more uh, members of species one than there are of species two. If you were a male in this environment, what might be your competitive advantage? These males are not learning, they're evolving, but assuming you were a male that was capable of learning, what would be a good thing to do if your sole goal in life was to find and mate with as many females as possible? Uh, join the most dominant group, possibly. Uh, Chris Ostrich here has the right answer. If you could evolve to respond correctly to both songs. Remember, at this point in time, there are females that belong to two different species, and they speak two different languages. If you are a male and you evolve the ability to respond appropriately to either language, then if you enter the territory of species one females or species two females, you're able to successfully mate with them and you will have a competitive advantage over males that will only mate if they enter the territory of the female to which that male species to which that male belongs. So there is an advantage here to becoming bilingual and at the next time step, at time step 12,000, we can see a growing group of males down here that are bilingual. Let me back up. At this point in time, there are only 20 of those males, and 2,000 time steps later, there are 128 males. Uh, these are males 13, 13. So they, stand, they go forward when they hear song one, they turn right when they hear song two, they, turn, they go forward when they hear song three, and they turn right when they hear the fourth song. Um, it's not quite clear from this picture, but they respond correctly to both female groups. If I advance to the next slide, which I'll do in a moment, we're going to go further forward into time. We're going to run the tape forward on this evolutionary process. What do you expect to see happening?
We have the emergence now of three species. More of the third species. So here's time step uh, 14,000. We have 470 of species 1, 286 males of species 2, 217 males of species 3. At time step 16,000, this is the case. You can see there's actually some other species out here, so there's uh, perhaps even more uh, than two languages. Time step 20,000, time step 30,000, time step 40,000. Uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke at the beginning of this experiment. In this case, they use uh, 1,600 females and 1,600 uh, males. So you can see that this bilingual species, so males that respond appropriately to two different languages, um, language one involves song zero, zero, uh, song zero, zero and zero, one. Uh, language two involves one, zero and one, one. Females are bilingual in the sense that they know which of the two languages to emit, given uh, the direction from which the male enters her territory. And males know how to respond to both languages. If they hear words, if you like, from language one, they know what to do. And if they hear words from language two, they know what to do. Okay, so uh, obviously this is a very uh, simple experiment and it demonstrates the evolution of a language which allows for coordination among the group as a whole. In this case, the coordinated behavior is simply to find each other and mate, but you can imagine an extension of this experiment where males and females are not only mating but evolving the abilities to do other things together collectively as a group and they use language amongst themselves to signal to each other what they, uh, what they should be doing under certain circumstances. Okay, so that concludes uh, lecture 24. We're gonna move on now. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of uh, schedule here. We're gonna move on to our final lecture in the series on collective robotics, which is self-replication. As we just saw in the previous lecture, once a male and female agent find each other, they produce copies of one another. Uh, if we do want to uh, deploy large numbers of robots to perform useful tasks in the real world, we can imagine uh, that members of that swarm may be damaged or fail or fall out. We could build more copies of that, the swarm and deploy them, but you can imagine that becomes relatively costly. Under certain circumstances, we might wish to allow uh, the robots to self-replicate and increase the size of the swarm autonomously. So if a small swarm is not able to perform the desired task, if they can self-replicate, they can autonomously grow the size of their group to succeed at self-replication. Uh, as Hollywood has more than adequately demonstrated, uh, this is not always the best thing to do. So there is an inevitable ethical side to thinking about creating self-replicating machines. And we'll get back to the ethical side of self-replication in our final lecture of the course on uh, Xenobots. But for today, we're just gonna focus on the nuts and bolts of how self-replication in machines might proceed. Okay. So, uh, uh, again, this basic idea, um, if you think about a machine that makes machines, we're already able to do that. There's a particular kind of machine called a factory, and that machine produces lots of other machines like computers or cars, but it is not self-replication because it is not a factory that produces factories. So we're going to focus on a specific type of machine today that can do something, which is to create a copy of itself which by then, by definition, that copied and reproduced thing makes copies of itself and so on. So any self-replicating machine, assuming it has sufficient uh, energy and raw materials uh, and left to its own devices, will increase its own numbers exponentially. 
Uh, in some cases, that may be useful if we want to try and scale up the size of a swarm of small machines to very large numbers of machines. And of course, from an ethical point of view, there may be conditions under which that is not such a good thing to do. Okay. So we're going to proceed today in this lecture uh, chronologically, and we're going to go back to the 1940s. We've, al we've already talked about John von Neumann uh, in this course earlier on. Um, for the computer science students uh, in the uh, audience today, uh, you're probably familiar with von Neumann architecture, which is a particular way to build computers. What we're focusing on today is von Neumann's universal constructor, often known as a von Neumann machine. This was a theoretical machine. There's sort of a, a picture of it up here. This is not a physical machine. This is basically a cellular automata or a mathematical construct. Um, so something that's sort of uh, written down with pen and paper. And John von Neumann actually did do this by pen and paper because computers did not quite exist at the time that he was doing this. Although obviously he was uh, deeply involved in the creation of the first computers. John von Neumann's mathematical construct uh, had three parts. One part was a blueprint, and that blueprint contained uh, a large amount of information. Uh, and you can see this blueprint represented as this very long tail here. So there was a one-dimensional tape uh, inspired by Turing machines that encoded information. Um, there was a mechanism that could read in that blueprint and construct the machine, construct a copy of that machine, which you see here center left, uh, construct the machine but without the blueprint um, that's specified by that blueprint. So this machine reads in, uh, reads in its own blueprint and by reading off the information, that information triggers actions inside this machine that causes the writing of all of the components of another machine over here. And then the third component of the universal constructor is a copy machine that is able to take this tape and copy just it and attach it to this machine. So we have a mechanism, I'm sorry, uh, in uh, A we have a mechanism, in A here we have a mechanism that constructs the machine specified by the blueprint. The copy machine makes a copy of that blueprint and at and then finally, that copied blueprint in C is placed into the new machine, resulting in a working replication of the original machine. We get this entire construct up here. And again, by definition, because this thing is now an identical copy of this thing, it will have identical behavior to this thing, which is that it will start constructing a new machine, and it will start copying the tape. And you can see this third machine is already partly uh, constructed. Uh, we don't have time today to go into the, the mathematical details of the universal constructor, but those of, that of you that are interested in self-replication, uh, it's definitely worth the time and effort uh, reading up on it and understanding it in more detail. As I mentioned, at this time in the 1940s, this was a purely theoretical idea. Um, von Neumann and others were interested in this because uh, they had already started to realize that if you could create these things called computers, and you could allow these computers to move and collect raw materials and use those raw materials plus some internal state, some internal information to make a copy of themselves, this might be a cost-effective way of building things at a large scale. In von, Neum von Neumann's idea, this was to build colonies on the moon or, or Mars by sending just one machine that when it reaches the target site, like the lunar surface, assuming this machine could collect enough raw material, would be able to create copies of itself. This is an idea that still, uh, almost uh, 80 years later, is still alive and well at NASA, and some of the plans that are on NASA's whiteboards are to create uh, actual von Neumann machines using 3D printers uh, and wheeled rovers uh, and so on. Okay, so speaking of physical machines, we're going to move forward now to 1959, and we're going to look at um, some interesting machines that were reported in an article in Scientific American uh, by Lionel uh, Penrose. Uh, and the title of this article is Self-Reproducing Machines. I'll show you a video of these machines in action uh, in a moment. 
But as you'll notice uh, in the figure in the top left here, these are very simple machines. They are not robots. Um, they are basically just uh, wooden, uh, wooden tiles that have a very specific geometry. You notice that we're going to put them inside this wooden crate and assume that there are a bunch of them that are horizontal to one another, like you see here. If we have uh, just these uh, tiles here, and imagine that we take this, uh, um, this crate in which we're sitting, and we rock this crate left and right, we are introducing kinetic energy into the system, and the two tiles will start to move uh, horizontally back and forth, shifting in the crate, and they may bump into one another. But assuming that the energy is low enough uh, they will continue to just knock into one another and nothing much will happen. However, if we introduce a seed, which is we take two, if we take two tiles out of the crate, uh, rotate them and slot them together, you'll notice that they have these particular hooks that will interlock and they will now hold their shape when we place them back into the crate. And we have basically added a seed uh, which will become a crystal, uh, crystal is in quotation marks here, I in indicating that these tiles are going to act like crystals, and that if we then start to shake the crate back and forth again, the seed will eventually knock into this tile on the right-hand side, and given the geometry of these two tiles, they will lock into place and we will now have a three tile construct. And if we continue shaking the box left and right, we will get additional uh, pieces added to this growing crystal. So this is not self-replication, where self here is the seed. We see we do not get additional two tile seeds. We get simply a seed that grows in length. But this crystal growth, as you'll see in a moment, is a stepping stone towards true mechanical self-replication. So we're looking now at mechanic, or we will in a moment look at mechanical self-replication. There's no circuits, there's no motors, there's no sensors. This is a purely physical uh, action, pure, purely mechanical phenomenon. Okay, so we'll watch the video. They're going to show you, uh, in the video, you're going to see a number of uh, tiles here. And we'll talk about the details of these tiles after the video concludes. Experiments shown in this film set out to solve the problem first clearly stated by the mathematician von Neumann. Can a machine be constructed which can automatically make another exactly like itself? If a machine could act like the living cell you see here, so long as the parts needed for making more machines were available, it would go on reproducing itself, and so also would its progeny. Perhaps the demonstration you're going to see may throw light on the process of cell division or gene replication. A practical attempt to solve the problem has recently been made in a series of experiments by L and R. Penrose. They began by making a kind of crystal that was formed in response to seeding or priming by a small part of itself. Each of these models, like those that follow, is simply made out of plywood. The pieces here are all alike. Each has four hooks. Energy is supplied by horizontal agitation in a confined space. But as you see there, the units don't link up. A linked pair is added, and the result now is that all the pieces join together in response to the agitation. Again, in the neutral state, the units don't link up. If the seed has a different form, you'll see it's tipped to the left this time. Then the crystal faithfully copies the new pattern. The crystal's more like a living organism if it's made aperiodic, by having only two hooks on each unit. There are two kinds of unit here, 
They're arranged randomly, and as before, they don't link up unless they are primed. A live group is made of two link units, and this is added to the others. The principle is no life except from life. Agitation causes the formation of a new live group wherever it's possible. A new group's appeared there on the right of the picture. The other one is the original seed. Now, if the seed is tilted in the opposite direction, again, it's faithfully copied, just as a mutant gene is copied. A more stable live group can be made from laminated units. As before, these units do not join up, and they're in the neutral state. Each one's made of three bits of plywood, pivoted at the center, as you can see here. And two of them are put together to form a live seed. This is introduced amongst the others, and in response to agitation, we have perfect replicas of the seed. There's one of the new ones, a child. This is the original seed, the mother, and there's another child on the left. These experiments can be developed in a variety of ways. For instance, we can add a mechanism that releases hooks. And in its simplest form, this leads to what might be called a steady state. It can be demonstrated by using ordinary clothes pegs. As you see here, there are always two together, but it's a different pair each time. The structure assimilates food at one end and rejects it at the other. This, as you see, is child's play and something you can try for yourself at home. But it's not quite as simple as it looks. It takes a little bit of practice, and the pegs have to be rather smooth so they'll jump off. This, you see, represents a metabolic state. And the same kind of thing can be shown rather more exactly by a model that's made with levers. When the levers are arranged in a particular way, you can then get two of the units holding together, and again, food can be taken in at one end and rejected at the other, just in the same way as we saw with the clothes pegs. If this metabolic process is doubled and made to work in opposite directions at the same time, it leads to reproduction. This model has two levers. and the units can be hooked together at the side. We start with two of these units joined together, and a third one is accepted, and when a fourth one is added, then the whole thing divides in the middle. You'll see that food can be accepted at either end, and again, the thing splits. Please. Okay, um, you can watch the rest of this video uh, at your leisure, but I think they've covered the basic ideas here, is that with a surprising simplicity, we can create mechanical systems whereby introducing kinetic energy into the system, that energy can be translated by the physical dumb mechanism into copies uh, of itself. So we're going to look at just uh, a few examples that you just saw in the video so we can see a little bit more about how this operates. Um, this was one of the earlier tiles we saw here. And what we're going to focus on here is, again, noticing that we have uh, two seeds. Uh, sorry, we have two individual units here. We're going to lock them together in this manner. But you'll notice that at the left end of the left tile and the right end of the right tile, they do not have hooks, they are smooth, meaning that when they lock together in this configuration, there is no other way for a third tile pair, you'll notice these are pairs now, there's no way for a third tile pair to connect. However, if this 
uh, seed now through random agitation pushes against this particular tile pair on its right. And if it pushes this tile pair to the right into a complementary tile pair that has hooks on its left, so complementary meaning that this tile pair here has a hook on its right, and this tile pair here has a hook on its left. This seed pushes this part into this complementary part, and they lock together, producing an identical copy of the parent. So you'll notice that these tiles are inspired by several features of biological uh, self-replication. Uh, we all know by now that the DNA chain contains complementary uh, base pairs. You'll notice that uh, you'll have noticed in the video that there were a lot of references to biological self-replication. Remember that this work was carried out uh, in the early, uh, sorry, the late 1950s, just a few years after DNA. The mechanism of biological inheritance self-replication and evolution had been uh, discovered. So for those of you that are students of the history of science, uh, it's very interesting to go back and read about Lionel Penrose himself and his relationships to uh, the scientific community at that time. And the inspiration that was already flowing in the 1950s from biology into, at least in this case, the physics of self-replication. Today, uh, we often talk about biologically inspired artificial intelligence, and evolutionary robotics is one branch or one type of bio-inspired AI. So back in the 1940s, even going back to von Neumann, uh, many computer scientists and mathematicians were being inspired by nature at that time. Okay, so we see here an example of perfect self-replication, but this was uh, just at the beginning of the video we just saw. There's uh, more. There are there is uh, some more complex tiles that we're going to look at in a moment that are also capable of producing perfect copies of themselves in a better way. What is the limitation of this current setup? Clearly, it makes copies of itself but it requires certain conditions to be met for that self-replication to occur. What are those specific conditions? If you have an idea, go ahead and type, type it into chat. It was mentioned briefly in the video. You need external agitation, that's correct, but all of the tiles that we saw, uh, all, of, all of the tiles that we saw in the video require external agitation. So there is an additional condition that these particular uh, hookless tiles require in order to self-reproduce. Uh, seeding, again, all of them are gonna require a seed, um, that's fine. Only pieces with the same shape can attach, exactly. So you'll notice in this example here, uh, we're creating the seed here on the left. This seed is able to make this copy of itself only if there is a uh, hook right tile pair here and a, to its right and a hook left tile pair to this tile's right. If we had hook right and hook right, or hook left and hook left, if this uh, seed banged into those pairs on the right, it would not produce a copy of itself. So you can think of this particular type of tile as a picky eater. If you think of these elements as food that are translated or translated into copies of itself, it is only able to self-reproduce if there's very specific food in its environment. It requires complementary hooks on, on either side. So the next tile that we're going to look at is also able to make a copy of itself, but it is not a picky eater. This particular, uh, this particular situation, in this, in this more complex one, we're going to look at a hook and latch system. So let's start by looking at the hook and latch system here. And this actually corresponds to the segment in the video we just saw of the small child putting together clothes pegs. So uh, imagine that we have this 
uh, isolated unit here, and as we shake the box back and forth, this isolated unit sh uh, moves to the right and happens to come into contact with another uh, hook unit, another latch unit on its right, and you'll notice that they will hook together. And this hook in latching onto the hook unit on the right pushes the latch in the latch unit on the right. It rotates it upward. And now if this connected pair continues to shuffle to the right and comes into contact with a third unit uh, on the right, it is, not able to, uh, it is not able to attach to it. Uh, however, if, um, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I described this incorrectly. Let me, let me start again. Assume that we have this isolated unit here and we have a unit pair over here that is already connected. If this isolated unit shuffles to the right and bangs into the pair on its right, this unit will attach to the middle unit here and it will push the latch of the inner unit. It will rotate it upward and it unlatches. It unlatches the right-hand pair and it is now the two left-hand units that become connected. So we now have a steady state system, meaning we have a pair and a singleton. And by shaking this back and forth, the pair can break apart can break apart into a singleton, and the singleton can attach to the inner pair, and we can repeat this process indefinitely. So this latch unit on its own does not produce self-replication. It only leads to steady state. Uh, if we now take, uh, if we take, if we now attach uh, units, la un uh, latch units together, one on top of the other we are going to be able to obtain self-replication. So let's see how this works. We have an already connected pair in the center here. As you can see, these two are latched together. If the singleton on the left uh, shuffles to its right and comes into contact with this pair here, this latch pushes into this latch and rotates the middle latch upwards, detaching this pair of units. However, uh, this latch here does not affect this latch, and so the pair remains connected by this latch. So here, this is this is latched and this is latched. This has become unlatched and this has become, but this remains latched. So we now have three connected components. If these, if this triplet shuffles to the right and comes into contact with the singleton on the right. This singleton pushes against this remaining latch and opens it. And if you look at panel C here, you'll notice that these four units now have an unlatched uh, system up top and an unlatched system underneath, meaning that these two pairs are now able to these two pairs are now able to move apart from one another, and we have self-replication. So here's the seed in the center, and after this process of uh, taking in food from the left and taking in food from the right, we get self-replication again. However, again, there is a limitation here to self-replication in that self-replication can fail in some cases. So what do I mean by fail? We see that we have the true seed, which is a pair, right, one, two. That pair temporarily becomes a quadruple, but that quadruple very quickly breaks into pairs. So we go from two to three to four, two, three, four, and back to two. It's possible for an error to occur in which we go back to crystal growth. We go from two to three to four to five to six to seven to eight to nine, and it keeps growing indefinitely and we lose self-replication. This one is particularly challenging. Um, can you see in either panel B or C how crystal growth can occur? 
If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. If you're not able to see it, don't worry, you're in good company. It took me a while to, to figure this one out as well. I'll give you a moment to think about it, and if anybody comes up with an idea, great. If not, we'll, uh, we'll carry on and, and see how that, uh, this crystal growth can occur here. Only pieces with the same shape can attach. That's correct. And all these have exactly the same shape. They all attach and produce self-replication. But even though these are all the same pieces, we went from two to three to four back to two and produced an additional pair, which is exactly what we want, self-replication. But are there other conditions? In this case, food came in from the left, and then food came in from the right. And if food comes in from the left, and then food in from the right, Everything works, but are there situations in which food can be supplied in, a, soup, in a, a particular pattern in which it doesn't work? We end up with crystal growth instead of self-replication. Can you see how that might occur? No? Okay, let's have a look. So let's look at the case where this doesn't work. Uh, can you continuously add to the left side in B? Very well done, Zoroman321 figured it out. Uh, if we have a pair here and instead of feeding, feeding food from the left and then from the right, we're going to continuously add food to the left and let's see what happens. Let's start with A for a moment. You'll notice there's an a open hook here and a hook acceptor up top. When food from the left attaches, that food from the left hooks into the upper level and its lower hook is open. Imagine in B here that another piece of food came in from the left. That additional piece of food from the left, its upper hook would attach to the latch here and become connected. And uh, its hook would sit underneath uh, here as well. And we would now have a four, uh, four connected piece, exactly like you see here. Imagine in the four piece here, yet another piece of food comes in from the left. You'll notice that if that happens, the left side in C looks exactly the same as the left side in B, meaning exactly the same thing will happen. The food from the left will attach and we'll have a five unit crystal. If another piece of food comes in, we'll have a six unit crystal and so on and so forth. So this uh, this system will only self-reproduce if food is supplied from alternating sides. You'll notice that in the case of successful self-reproduction down here, it is very unlikely that food for the right-hand uh, piece will arrive from the left and then the right because of the fact that there is no food, uh, there is no gap or very little gap on the left side of here. So again, we have a system in which self-replication only occurs under specific cases, like we saw here. So we're going to look at the uh, we're going to look at the fourth and final system here, which is capable of self-reproduction uh, um, regardless of which side food arrives from, and it's not a picky eater. There's only one type of food, which is this very complicated tile here. And as long as we keep supplying pieces that look exactly like this, regardless of which side we apply it on, this thing will continue to produce copies uh, of itself. Okay, take a deep breath. Here we go. So we have the uh, latch pair system that we just saw from the previous example up top. The lower level here, we see our, uh, our hookless pieces. The idea here is that this is the thing that's actually being, th this thing here is the thing that's actually being reproduced. This is the, the seed that we would like to see reproduced. We have another system at the bottom, which has these uh, wide T pieces. And you'll notice that these T pieces, the stem of the T hangs down into the concavity of the lowest block.
And what this means is, uh, let's see if I can demonstrate this. If my upper hand here is the T piece and the lower piece is the concavity, this T piece can shake back and forth, uh, can shake left and right inside the lower block. And if the T pieces, uh, if the uh, tops of the T's come into contact with one another, they can push against one another. You'll notice that in the seed here, the two T's have bumped into one another and pushed uh, and allowed their inner, their inner blocks these pieces to snap together, but the T's keep their position. So the left part of this T is protruding a little bit to the left of the lower block, and this T, the right part of this T, is protruding a little bit to the right of the lower block. These T pieces, as we'll see in a moment, are going to stop the runaway crystal proce crystallization process that this particular block system, tile system, suffered from. Okay, so here we go. We introduce our seed here in A. In B, we assume that food from the left has come into contact with the seed, causing the upper pair of latches, the upper latch to connect. So we now have these three pieces connected uh, together. In panel C, food from the right has come into contact has, has come into contact uh, with uh, the three unit piece here, and this uh, lower latch in the right hand piece of food is pushing against this latch and causes this remaining connector here to unlock. So if we now look right down the center of this four unit uh, four unit system, we'll see that this latch is unconnected and this latch is unconnected, meaning that the two pieces, if we continue to shake, will gradually separate from one another. And we've now made a copy of the original seed. If we go back to C for a moment, you'll notice uh, that the T's underneath, the, the uh, T in the leftmost uh, unit and the T in the rightmost unit, just because of their shape, are now protruding uh, quite a ways out from the left or the right, meaning that um, this unit, which is just accepted food, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back, uh, let's go back to B for a moment. Uh, we just fed B with food from the left, and it's about to receive food from the right, which will lead, as we just saw, to self-replication. But instead, if instead of receiving food from the left, the random shaking left and right tried to provide another piece of food from the left, that food would not be able to get close enough to this unit because the blocking T at, at the bottom will push that piece of food away from the left. So just through mechanical obstruction, we can keep food arriving in the right pattern and produce self-replication. Okay, any questions about that before we move on? It's a, a fascinating area of study where we can create relatively sophisticated forms of self-replication using, again, just pure mechanics. So we've gone from a theoretical construct. We've gone from a theoretical construct, the von Neumann machine, to a physical construct, which is uh, it's purely mechanical, so no electronics yet. As you can imagine, uh, in the next case, we're going to move on to uh, robotics. But before we do, I want to just take a very temporary uh, diversion into chemistry. Um, we're going to look at self-replicating robots in a moment. But of course, self-replication is also an important part of the story of life and how life started. So uh, in evolution, regardless of whether we're talking about evolution in biology or evolution in machines, we can ask the question about how does evolution get started in the first place? In chemistry, uh, you may remember that we can talk about uh, macromolecules or chemical compounds. Um, and through a complicated chemical process, they can very slowly make a copy of themselves, which is shown in this cartoon here. We're going to assume we have some information-carrying 
macromolecule, uppercase I, and this macromolecule can very, very slowly, assuming that atoms bump into it in just the right way, to make a copy of itself. However, in this process, this information-carrying macromolecule also uh, gives off other chemical compounds, one of which becomes an enzyme which catalyzes the self-replication of a second information-carrying macromolecule, I2. So in this cartoon, we have five chemical compounds. Each of them, given enough time, and it may be a very, very long time, can produce copies of themselves. But they may also produce enzymes, and remember that enzymes accelerate chemical, uh, chemical transformations. So in this cartoon example here, I1 produces as a byproduct of its slow self-replication a molecule E1, which accelerates the catalysis, uh, which catalyzes uh, I2. So I2 is able to make a copy of itself slightly faster than it would otherwise. I2 in turn gives off an enzyme which catalyzes I3, and we can see this process uh, continues, and you can imagine this chain continuing indefinitely. So we have a form of self-replication here, which is the self-replication of I1, I2, I3, I4, and I5, but it's very, very slow. It turns out that in chemistry you can get situations that are known as hypercycles. So this takes us forward into the 1970s now, and it was shown uh, it was shown theoretically and then using actual chem uh, chemical compounds that you can get a, a, a chain of these catalyzing reactions, and if the enzyme of one of them ever catalyzes one of the macromolecules upstream of the chain, in this case I1, we obviously get a cycle. So if I1 on its own takes a very, very long time to self-reproduce and very slowly gives off E1, E1 will accelerate I2, I3, I4, I5, E5, and E5 will speed up the replication of I1 a little bit, increasing the rate of production of E1 which increases the rate of production of I2, I3, I4, I5, and yet more E5 further accelerates the speed of production of I1, and you can imagine an engine which is very, a chemical engine which is very slowly warming up and getting going, and we will very quickly start to get uh, large numbers of I1, I2, I3, I4, and I5 leading to, uh, again, assuming that these things are all swimming around in some soupy mix, as long as some collection of I1, I2, I3, I4, or I5 drifts away, we now have a second hypercycle. Both of them are producing large amounts of I1 through I5. If those drift further away, they're further producing another hypercycle, and so on, and we get, get self-replication. But how do we go from self-replication to evolution? What, what is the part of this process that I just described that's missing? This is not quite evolution yet. It's self-reproduction. We can imagine uh, groups of these chemical compounds or these hypercycles reproducing themselves. What's missing? What are some of the necessary ingredients in an evolutionary process that are not present yet in the hypercycle? Exactly, mutation. So what does mutation look like in this system, what would be a mutation that could occur to a reproducing hypercycle that would make the new hypercycle reproduce faster, produce more copies of itself than the parent hypercycle, which is the, uh, the, the, the missing step. This is what leads to evolution. What kind of mutation might occur to this system that would make it reproduce faster? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Uh, we could get improved enzymes, exactly. So you could imagine that uh, there's a, slight, a mutation that slightly changes uh, I1's process. 
so that it produces maybe a slightly different E1 that accelerates the production of I2, or that could happen anywhere along uh, here. Um, another idea is that I1 produces, I1 produces E4 rather than E1, exactly. So uh, in this little mutation that I'm showing here, we assume that there is a change to I, uh, to I prime, and I prime gives off E prime, and E prime actually catalysizes I3, and we're accelerating through this, uh, we're going through this loop faster. There's a cost though, we're losing I2. So in this child, this child is now gonna be a collection of I1, three, four, five, but it's gonna produce that faster than the parent which needed to go through four intermediate steps to produce more of I1. So you can imagine self-reproducing copies of hypercycles and mutations are causing slight changes to those collection of macromolecules that causes certain groups to accelerate a little bit, uh, to reproduce a little bit faster than their fellows, leading to more and more rapid self-replication and a larger and larger variety of hypercycles. Okay, um, I just copied and pasted this from the Wikipedia page. You can go and read up on hypercycles. This shows all the things that, that we need. We need a cycle of self-replicating. That's the curved arrow here. Information carrying macromolecules. So they've got some information here that's useful for the self-replication. Each macromolecule produces E, an enzyme that catalyzes or accelerates the production of another macromolecule. They all need to be linked up in such a way that eventually, uh, they need to be linked up so that each one catalyzes the creation of its successor, the next one in the link. And the last link in the chain has to produce an enzyme that catalyzes the first one. If we have a collection of macromolecules that satisfy all four of these conditions, then we have a hypercycle, and again, assuming uh, the medium in which they exist allows them to drift apart and continue doing what they do, we're gonna get not just self-replication, but the beginnings of evolution. Okay. Okay, so finally, uh, we're gonna now look, uh, we've looked at self-replication in math, we've looked at self-replication in mechanics, uh, pure physics, and we've looked at self-replication in chemistry. Let's take all of those ideas and build them into a robotics platform. Um, this is a project that I also helped out with uh, a little over uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I'll play the video, and I think that'll be the last thing that we talk about today. And I want you to notice some of the, as you're watching this video, I want you to note down some of the features about how this robot produces copies of itself and how some of those features were inspired by the projects that we just looked at. Okay, um, so you'll notice uh, just a couple of details that may not have been uh, immediately obvious from the video. Um, these individual units have no batteries inside, they have no autonomous power. Um, so they're basically passive unless they come into contact with uh, the ground plane. 
which you'll notice uh, has these magnetized plates. These magnetized plates provide power uh, to the system. So if there is a unit that is attached to one of these uh, ground plates, it's able to draw power. And if it in turn connects to another unit, it can supply power to that unit and so on. So electrical power flows uh, up one of these towers of connected uh, units. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, please uh, watch this video again if you need to. Note down features of the self-replication process that you can tell are inspired by the previous three projects uh, that we looked at. And we'll start by talking about some of those features when we meet uh, next Tuesday morning. Uh, that concludes today's lecture. Uh, for the UVM students, you have a quiz due uh, tonight. You're continuing to work on your weekly uh, reports. And I will now stay on the stream until probably about 10.30 this morning uh, for office hours. So for those of you that have questions about today's lecture uh, or uh, questions about your final project, please stay on the stream and I'm happy to take your questions and chat. Otherwise, uh, have a good day. Thanks very much.